Hello, I'm retired Battalion Chief Larry Cockman from the Greensboro, North Carolina Fire Department History Book Committee. We're here today at the Greensboro Historical Museum. I'm standing in front of the General Green, the first steam pumper, or as they called it back then, a steamer. Today, December 9th, 2019, we are starting a new tradition of recording and preserving the heritage and culture of our retirees. Our retirees have contributed so much to the success of our great fire department. Their stories retire with them and are sometimes gone forever when they pass away. They will share their emergency calls that will always be a part of their memories forever. So sit back and listen as they carry us through their journey in the Greensboro Fire Department. Clifford Wayne Oakley, age 73, uh, captain from 1977 till August 16th, 2016. 47 years, eight months of service. So far I've got the longest record of contingent. It used to be a mandatory retirement at 62. I found in the rule book where with the chief's written letter to city council, he could extend a year at a time. So, and I kept telling the city attorney, that's age discrimination. And right before I retired, the city attorney called me and said, you're right. So now, you Green Floor Fire Department, you can stay as long as you can do the job, no matter what the age. I had uh, four years of military time, so I come up with 51 years and eight, eight months. If I'd stayed four more years where I've been there for 55 years, they would have had to give me a raise to retire. I would have drew 100.1%. Uh, I grew up in the Greensboro, in Glenwood area. Uh, there was several chiefs that lived in that area and captains like Captain Roland Scott, Captain Jack Coble, and several others lived actually in that neighborhood. Yes, I was, I'm related to uh, several. Red Wren, uh, he come on during World War II. As a matter of fact, he was the only firefighter that I'm aware of that never had a high school education. And then uh, my brother, uh, he came on uh, three years before I did and because we was in service and he got out earlier than I did. So he retired early, he just stayed 37 years and I stayed 47 years. My brother's name was Bob Oakley or Robert Oakley. Uh, he was a captain and then it was at Engine 15. He did, we've, um, we've always, my brother and I have always had the same job together. His first job was Air Condition Corporation in Greensboro. My first job was Air Condition Corporation in Greensboro. He went in the Navy, I went in the Navy. He was on the USS O'Hara DD-889. I was on the USS O'Hara DD-889. He was second class in the forward engine room. I was second class in the after engine room. So we stayed on. The city of Greensboro has been family tradition. My grandfather was a motorcycle police officer for uh, Greensboro, Fire, uh, Greensboro Police Department. My other grandfather worked for the public school systems. I uh, had a cousin, uh, Donna Wren, that actually was a paramedic and worked in communications, 911 operator. So it's been kind of a family job. I actually applied through the mail. I was still in service. And during that time, uh, it was getting close to the end of service. If the chief of police or the chief of the fire department uh, needed employees, you could get a 90 day out early. And Chief Fowler wrote a letter to my captain of the ship. But I missed it because we pulled out two days before he got the letter. So I ended up pulling it for four years. So we, uh, when I come back in, I went to see Chief Fowler and put in the application. They did the background check and the family interviews, and, and which wasn't a whole lot to do because they had already did all the interviews with my brother and their family. Never thought I could because, uh, actually again, my brother went 
and put in his application before uh, service. And at that time, the Greensboro Fire Department would not hire kin people. So if you had any kin on the fire department, you was null and void right off the bat. Uh, then a little bit later on, uh, my aunt died and the Greenboro Fire Department, uh, it was a couple of my uncles was the, on, did the pallbearer and I seen uh, how it helped my mother. Starting, my, my starting salary was, I started off with a real good salary. I started out at $513 a month. That was the exact same thing I was making in, in service as an E5. Had, uh, we originally started out with nine in a training class, and one, I remember him coming in late and in fire, but I think he was running low on his test scores too. But uh, he'd come in one minute late, and that kind of hit the cutting room floor, so to speak. The, the rest of us, it was eight, one, and we was known for some reason as a magnificent seven. I hadn't figured out who they was leaving out, but. One of them was left out. Probably this cotton guy that ended up making it. <laughs> That's funny. No, because it wasn't nothing funny in training. Because <laughs> it was dead serious. But uh, yes, I remember uh, breaking a window out with a football. And I remember racing the creeper in the garage and going down the hole where they changed the oil. But other than that, everybody come out alive and well and everybody the rest of the group, eight out of the nine passed and <laughs> continued on for 30 years. Well, it probably took a little while because uh, I re remember the, the first call I went on, uh, I know that's probably skipping a little bit ahead, but the first call I went on, that's when we've kind of freelanced and you've done what you was taught to do. Well, the grass was real high in this yard. It just annexed uh, this area. It was a vacant house. So I'm going to be a tough guy. I'm going to run up there and go in that house. Uh, but I fell in a well. <laughs> and I spent the rest of the fire trying to get out of that well. It wasn't but about eight or ten foot deep, but it's hard to climb out. <laughs> My first station assignment was uh, Central Station. And actually, I was a rover. So I got to work under a lot of captains. I uh, went to my longest serving. We had a fireman at Station 3 that had broken a foot or something, and he was out. So I went and took his place. And uh, Captain Sam Goins was the captain there, and Willie Johnson and George Trogdon. And uh, I told him, I wanted to drive that truck. And Captain Goins said, well, this was on a Friday when I had to go up there. He said, well, I'll give you a street test Monday. And if you can pass it, we'll let you drive. And I said, okay. So Station 3 had an easy territory because they were squared off like boxes. So I memorized it by the map. And uh, he came there, he drew it out on the board. I filled them in and got all of them right. He said, okay, let's drive the truck. I said, well, how do you, how do you how do you put this? I never drove a non-synchronized transmission. How do you do this? <laughs> so we spent the next two or three work days him showing me, uh, him and George talking, showing how to change gears without tearing the transmission out of them. <laughs> uh, I had several nicknames. Probably the administration had a lot for me, but <laughs> I was best known as Captain O, and then now Chief Boggs, who wasn't Chief then. Nicknamed me the Godfather because I'd been on so many years. <laughs> the funniest prank that lasted for several years uh, was from a guy named Fowler, Steve Fowler. We couldn't understand why uh, the, another captain, which I won't mention his name, we couldn't get along together. And uh, too good for years now, he's in, you sit beside him in an interview. <laughs> He was, uh, I couldn't understand. He would always be mad at me for some reason. Well, I didn't find out until several years later. Uh, I'd always had the habit of 
cleaning the bathroom floor left because I didn't want nobody to clean them up. I'd clean the commode and wash some dry and everything out. And, well, Steve would come in there and he'd get a chocolate bar and he'd spread chocolate all around the commode and stuff. And if he could find a babe roof and buy a babe roof, he would throw it in the, in the, the toilet. And this captain would always, every, every the morning, he'd run over and, and get the power and say, Come look at this. That Oakley takes so many vitamins and stuff, it must keep him just tore up. So, the best part about that, that probably went on three years. I, I bet he spent half his retirement in, in candy. <laughs> but that, that was the most well thought out prank that <laughs> was ever played on me. The union was active to start with, and yes, I was a member, and then the union dissolved. And then I was in a very serious fire truck accident where someone was killed. And uh, the city attorney called me. I said, well, do I need to tie up funds or whatnot? This went on for about five years. And they said, uh, well, we're the city's attorney, not yours. Uh, to their benefit. Everything worked out all right. The other person had a blood alcohol content. Mm -hmm. But to make a long story short, uh, I'd say 15 to 20 years later, the city attorney called me when I was at my last station of duty and said, would you tell me what happened? And I told him, he said, can you remember the person's name? And I said, no, I kind of described him. But he said, sure, everybody, that will not happen again. Yeah, we will give you full support, any driver or any fireman. So uh, I thought that was pretty good, the city attorney, to come back after 10, 15 years or longer. Actually, actually longer. Mm -hmm. Time flies. Yeah, that was one of the things that uh, I always wanted the crews to do. And what is that? Uh, cook and eat together and live together. And they did. I was at uh, one station for 17 years, and uh, I would see my wife and kids, in which I have a lot of kids, I have six kids. They'd come pulling in, and I hadn't even talked to them. And that would be because uh, Frank Fortune and Crawford Jones had cooked up 50 to 60 pieces of chicken and all, and they knew how my family ate. <laughs> and would call and invite them over to supper with them. And uh, every station I was at, Ten, five, four, we all ate together and you could together. Now I started a rule this last station or started made a suggestion. So let's cook four days in a row. And then that way you wouldn't have to cook but uh, once or twice a year. And I, I fooled them in believing that was a good system. And we started out, I started first, got my four days over with, and everybody went through it. Once they went through it, they said, we don't want this no more. But now on B shift, anybody gets transferred to B shift has to cook four cook days in a row or pair it with somebody else and do every other. And to this day, they're still, still doing that. That's an initiation. I had one guy, uh, Luke, that was transferred from the engine company to the rescue. And he changed his mind after about a month that he wants to be in a ladder cup. So when he comes to the rescue, I said, you was transferred. That's four cook days. And then two months later, when he went to the ladder company, I said, well, that's four more cook days. <laughs> so he ended up cooking 12 days in a row. <laughs> so oh, they, they tried to follow that tradition. Uh, I think cooking and, and eating together is very essential because uh, that's when you get to know your your brothers in the fire service. Uh, it's, a, it's a family. Uh, I was there so long that I actually had people that have rode my company and worked for me that I held when they were babies. Uh, it's amazing uh, how fast life flies by. And uh, it makes them uh, proud. They was there when my kids were born it was there when my parents died. So, yeah, I think it's a very extensive. Uh, my family misses the fire department 
uh, as much or more than I do. Uh, when they come back, uh, I have one daughter that has MS and she lived in France and they, they come up with a, a run for MS uh, several times. Uh, Jesse Walker, my workout partner for years, he come up with the Casey run and we did a run at Battleground Park. But they, they're there in time of need. Uh, I was a terrible cook. <laughs> but uh, my favorite dish to cook was getting anything that was, took less than 12 minutes to cook. Don't worry about it. So uh, I tried to tell the guys, I said, if you spend more than 12 minutes in the kitchen, you've done something wrong. <laughs> well, it never did work out that way. <laughs> But I put it on in the morning and let it cook all day. Uh, I, I did everything from fried chicken to barbecue. To, it's, it's not a eating rotation, it's a cooking rotation. You cook it as long as they pay for it, that was great. But I did try to do a good job. I like the dorm type bedrooms uh, for a simple reason. We can study together, you can live together. But understanding now that there's there's females involved and all. I understand the need for the cubicles, but I think it does take a lot of the social aspect out of it. Now, my companies, we had a workout program. Every company, every station I've been at, we set up a, a gym and we had, at four o'clock in the afternoon, at most of the stations, we'd have workout time. Now, one station I did it in the morning, and if they didn't get the number of reps done, by five o'clock, it occurred interest and they would have to do more push-ups. <laughs> See, very little downtime, uh, especially at the station I was at. Uh, it was also a state USAR team, so it was always a lot of equipment to go over, always a lot to do. We worked out together. Our families would come there together. So after, at first, when I went over there, they were staying up to 11, 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. And I told them, I said, look, we got to do something different. You're going to burn out doing this. We'll get it done. We'll get it done during the day. And at 4 o'clock, we can be off. We can start back again at 6 or 8 for another hour. But uh, what you need to do is get some downtime, talk with your family, and stay together. The, I think the, in the fire service we had a problem. You and I, in the first few years we was on, you realized there was five suicides. So you've, you've got to have a release. You don't think it's bothering you, but it does. Well, the, the, if, when you retire from the fire, station, fire service, a lot of people hesitate on coming back to the station because they don't know anyone. Uh, and that's, that's true, even, even in my case. They call, invite me, and I scold for not coming by more often. Uh, my family makes me go by because they want to go by. They go by. When my kids come in, they bring their kids and we go to the fire station and the other firefighters bring their kids, uh, I should say they bring grandkids, and they play with the other firefighters' kids and stuff. So it's, it's like I say, it's, it's a family, and it's not only a family with the city of Greensboro, and I didn't realize, the first time I realized it's really a true brotherhood was when the city of Greensboro sent me with Mr. Walker, Jesse Walker, down to Florida. He was gonna do his first one to compete in the Firefighters Combat Challenge, and they didn't, didn't want him to go by himself. So we flew down there, we had no transportation, hotel, and we was walking across the parking lot and we had Greensboro Fire shirts on, t-shirts on, and some other firefighters actually ended up being from Winston-Salem. Said, if y'all got a ride? Yeah, they said, no, said, you, can, you, do, you do now. And this one thing I liked about the uh, combat challenge is, <clears throat> I had a sponsor, another firefighter at a sports water company, and 
my family and I got to travel all over the eastern United States and to Las Vegas competing in the Firefighters Combat Challenge. Uh, and you realize you may be in a different city, but the type of person that you run into is the same they are here. All firefighters are alike. They're, they're joking, uh, but they can be serious at, at times. I did fairly well for an old guy uh, in the over 50. I, I won first place several times. Uh, we couldn't run then. My, my times was two minutes, 28 seconds. Now they're doing it less than two minutes. Uh, and uh, we went out to Las Vegas, competing in the world's challenge, and did pretty good on the way out there. We all flew. Well, uh, my whole family got the flu. Night before run, we was, <laughs> we was throwing up and not feeling too well. Uh, still did a fairly decent run, got two bags of fluid after, so we felt much, <laughs> much better. But it was some great guys. I don't care if it took you one minute and 20 seconds or five minutes and a half. You had a group from everywhere cheering you on and wishing you the best. And the, can't, I remember one of the things I remember is my kids hollering, go Diddy. I do remember first call, that's one I fell in the well on. <laughs> I had a, so after, after that, that I did a little bit better. And uh, I know it was several, several fires uh, that wasn't much to them, which was good to get my feet wet on. And the cabins were good. Uh, I do remember when we'd have a working house fire and whatnot, the older cabins would tell you, eat that smoke, boy. Don't waste time putting air pack on. Um, and we did. Then I sneak around and put our air pack on because I couldn't take it. <laughs> it was, but most of those are gone. Uh, we had, I was, I don't know if you want to say fortunate enough to have a major injury, but to get the opportunity to have some major fires. Uh, driving when my, I was stationed at Station 7 and uh, the captain was off, and it was Captain Levi Miller, and I it was Clarence here was the driver. He rode over, moved over to Captain, and he said, you're driving. I said, oh my goodness. We got a call and you can see it when we pulled out of Station 7, which is a Gatewood and Wendover, and you can see the fire in the sky. And it was Jesse Wharton School. We had well, like two lines in, two lines back, and pumped. It was so far away, you couldn't hardly see the fire. It was so far away. And then my second working fire, was proximity school, uh, which seems like I've got a, uh, had a lot of school fires. <laughs> and, but while we was in training, we had a, a, one of the, of a huge fire, which we didn't get to do anything but pull hose and we laid, three miles of hose was laid off, and it was Greensboro Bonded Warehouse. I was actually at home because we had already got off, and you could see. 55-gallon uh, barrels flying air, air, blowing air like fireworks. Mm -hmm. And then, let's see, I had a Carolina Theater fire, which that was a, probably, I know one of the questions you ask if you've ever been scared, uh, afraid on the fire. Uh, any firefighter that says they hadn't been afraid on the fire is one of two things. He's not telling the truth or he's at a station that don't ride. Because uh, the Carolina Theater was probably the one I was most afraid of because we was riding two men on a company because I had a QRV, which is a quick response vehicle assigned to me. And they was out on another call. So we pulled there and they said, ventilate. Well, we had two guys, there's a driver and, and me. Uh, he put the ladder up, I go up there and it's a cement roof. <laughs> but it, to my advantage, it was a, uh, a door opened for the top of the elevator, which I opened the door and pulled the back roof and ventilated. Went back down here. And uh, the problem was locating the fire. And the Carolina was, was, theater was built during segregation. And I didn't even realize there was a second balcony and a second uh, 
concession. But to get to, while we were trying to search for the fire, you went in through the thing, and it was a cement wall, uh, two cement walls you had to go through. You had to take your air pack off, hold it over your head, uh, and then climb up a, a rung ladder for two stories. And you'd often look, so they didn't leave you for about five or ten minutes. Well, when I was coming back out to get another air pack, I got wedged in between the cement wall, uh, holding an air pack over my head and run out of air. Uh, so, one of this, I won't say panic mode, but I would not say it wasn't panic mode. Because when I did get, get out, I, I sure was glad. And got out and got another air pack. And then it was assigned, uh, they said, take your group in or we know where the fire is now. So it took five other people in there. And on the way up the steps, I uh, seen a uh, recognized a leg muscle. And I said, we've got somebody on the stairwell. But that was a, and then, like I said, I had a, a lot of them at Eastern Gifford High School, which was a big fire. We were, another school fire. I like schools. Uh, I think it's uh, better living through education. But it was, uh, we was, was in, in the county. It was called, uh, I think it was 45 minutes after the fire had started. Uh, so that's the first time we ended up taking a uh, four inch line in and hooking up a monitor. We were wired off with two, two and a half. And it was making some pretty good headway. And then we was given the order to evacuate. So after about 30 minutes, we talked to me and they said, let us go back in. Went back in and we set up a monitor on the inside. Uh, so I was proud of saying that, that was the only part of school was left standing for a week. <laughs> and he set, set, the, set the monitor up. But as I was coming out the door, they had, my, I found I had my phone in my pocket. I felt it vibrating. I uh, asked the phone and it was my wife, Donna. She said, where are you at? I said, I'm coming out the door right now. She said, oh yeah, I see. I said, y'all be careful. I said, well, you're too late to that. <laughs> so, yeah. But they had to replace uh, our walkies and our turnout gear because what happened, the tar had dropped down. Between, uh, that was the only school in Gift County that was not sprinkled. Well, uh, one you hadn't seen a picture of that uh, probably made the most impact on me was a 12-year-old that committed suicide. Uh, she, she shot herself in the head because she made a bad grade. And what? that was the highlight of my, my career, I uh, would say, uh, with uh, one fire. We was actually already out in, in the territory and seen smoke. And about that time, the police department called back in. They had a house fire in the has a project with people inside. Well, when we got there, it was a, a guy standing on the roof of a porch trying to get in. And I told uh, uh, my company, said, put a ladder up there while I did a walk around. I went around, find, found the glass sliding door open, uh, come back around and got the driver of engine 11 to bring a line around. And I said, hit, hit it there. It was at the bottom of the stairwell. It was a, Pretty good little, it was a couch and several other pieces of furniture burning, pretty smoky. And I knew it was people inside. So right or wrong, I went in without, without air pack, without turnout gear, and went up steps, upstairs, and went in a, one room and found uh, a pile of kids and a, and a pregnant woman. I took the baby and handed a baby out the second story window to Emmett Van Ness. And then picked up another child and took him to the steps and met a fireman coming up. And like a dummy, instead of telling him where he was, give him that one. Then went back and got one more. Went down and started CPR on him. And actually the newspaper had a picture of him uh, uh, when he took his first breath and started crying. and. Uh, I actually ended up riding in the hospital with him, and I could hear Crawford Jones inside when he, he said, I found her, here she is. 
and they brought the pregnant lady and a, another child out, and they were successful too. So all of them lived, uh, which was absolutely amazing. Uh, Chief of the Fire Department, Chief Powell, was at the station door the next morning at about 7.15, which was good and bad. He was going to congratulate us, but at that time you had to be in full uniform when you got on or got off. And I will say none of my company was in full uniform. They was all in civilian clothes. So, uh, but he's, he's still does a good job on You know, I did, while I was going through some information, found a letter from a lady uh, where we went in her child had quit breathing. They had just got out of the hospital. And we went in, I found her, and actually, uh, took her from her and uh, turned her turned around. And I probably shouldn't tell this on film, but actually she couldn't see it, uh, dropped the baby. Mm -hmm. Well, the baby started breathing again then. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Lord looked out to me. When, the day 9-11 uh, happened, we was at Station 10, and we, it was actually during our morning workout routine. And we kept the TV on the news, and I, I seen they showed that first plane that it hit. And I called Station 8 to tell the chiefs that, get you guys watch this, we see how New York did. Because uh, several firemen, uh, Jay McCarter and, and Gibbs and several others would go up to New York City and ride in the Bronx. I would ride in Engine 75, and those were some firefighting guys. Uh, and I said, watch this, let's see how New York handles this. See if it's the way we would uh, attempt to handle it. Uh, and, uh, and then about that time, the second plane hit and we knew we was in, in trouble. And uh, it wasn't long before we was on lockdown because of the, uh, the uh, petroleum that we have here and out at the airport. It's the largest petroleum plant, and I think it's number 10 on the tariffs list. So they had the National Guard come out and uh, secure the station. Uh, oh, I went up to New York, not on the, uh, not when we did the cleanup. Okay. But I, I did go up to New York uh, before then, and went up actually several times. Because uh, I figured you could get a lot of experience from them guys. Uh, they had one gentleman there they called a can man. And when we'd pull up in front of us, he'd run up the fire seat. All the buildings seemed to be like six stories. He'd break the window out with the bottom of the can and dive in. And I believe that man could put out more fire with a two and a half gallon fire extinguisher than I could with a two and a half inch hose line. <laughs> Because he seemed to have it knocked down every time we got up there. Oh, golly, uh, mentors in the fire department. It was so many mentors that, that I couldn't tell you. You learn something from every one of them. Uh, uh, if is either how to do something or how not to do something. So if, I mean, up to the up to the day before I left. I, matter of fact, I've got. Picture over there of my last working fire. My last working fire was over off Franley Avenue. It was a nice looking house from the outside, but it, actually from the inside it was used as storage for a, a hoarder. And you couldn't walk for all, all the stuff. It was, but they kept, uh, it was in the model airplanes and it was plumb full of model airplanes. And kept a heater in there to keep them freezing. And when the heater short out, it said all that airplane blew and you know, on fire. It wasn't a major fire, but it, I just remember it because it was my last one. Last one. So I think you, my biggest challenge in the Greensboro Fire Department was maybe keeping my mouth shut. <laughs> I would tend to speak when I shouldn't, I, I do say. I'm terrible on the interviews. Uh, uh, you know, I always wanted to make my family proud, but uh, 
that's the only reason I took the Chiefs process three times. And in my heart, I didn't want it. Uh, and I think the last one, last time I took it, I stuck my head back in the door and told them, if you make me Chief, you're dumber than I am. Uh, because I loved being captain. My family loved me being captain. Uh, it was, uh, I tried to teach my guys, the ones that want to be captain, uh, about four, four or five things. One is panic breeds panic. So I don't care what you don't know, if you look like you're under control, things are going to get better. And, and two was you always look after your men, you take the blame. Because if you knew they was doing something and they was doing it wrong, or, or there was something that wasn't legal, if you knew it, it's your responsibility. That's why one reason I had so many, <laughs> I think I hold a record for the number of written recommend. <laughs> if it wasn't for Faye Manheim, who was here 44 years, I believe, as secretary, she should have been, <laughs> she was powerful. She, she kept my job because when you had two written recommends in the same year, they were supposed to fire you. She would call me and tell me, like I'm going to lunch. This was for computers and all. I said, your file's on my desk. <laughs> so one of them would get missing. <laughs> Second one was we had GOGs, Greensboro Operational Guidelines. And I tell my, would tell my guys, this is guidelines, it's not rules. And I had one incident where we had a pin in, the car had clipped the pole, the lady was pinned in. The high tension line was laying down, not touching the car, but I, but I knew the car wasn't hot because I seen an old policeman walk by and touch it. So I had my guys over there and one of my guys said he had a hot stick in his pocket and he said, these lines are hot. I said, I know, but the car's not. So he kind of said, we're not supposed to do this. So I laid my hand on the car. I said, then you need to go over there and sit down. We need to get this person out. And we did get the person out and got her to the hospital within the golden hour. And I got a call from uh, uh, an assistant chief that was on vacation. And he was furious. And he said, I don't want to have to tell the chief of the fire department that you broke the guidelines, the GOGs. I said, do you know what GOG stands for? And, he said, yeah. I said, well, you don't have to tell him because I'm going to go there in the morning and I'm going to tell him we got the lady out of the car in a golden hour. No firefighter was hurt. No equipment was damaged. And these guys deserve a pat on the back for technical rescue. And, needless to say. And he, I think what he was doing, he was probably going on Here's some incorrect information. But any recommend I got, I well deserve. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, I worked with uh, female firefighters. Uh, I think, uh, I'm trying to think the first one, I don't remember if it was DN or... Pyramid? K Pyramid. I think it was K. Uh, I was at 11, I think uh, she was at 8, and we had a fire, a little furnace fire, it was underneath the house. And, Crawled in there, and pretty good little distance crawl, pretty pretty hard crawl, and uh, here she come in, and I didn't know how to accept uh, female firefighters at that time. I said, uh, "Hey rookie, go get me a fan." Yeah, uh, you know, it was a box fan. It wasn't hardly room enough for us to put in there, much less. Here she comes dragging that box fan in there, and she got in there. I said, "Okay, now you can take it back," and. Uh, I said, I just want to see if you do what I ask you. And I said, you got my vote. She did the good, she was a good firefighter, made captain, you know, went on. Uh, the other first female went on to be chief, uh, I think assistant chief, if I'm not mistaken. Deputy. Deputy chief. I don't think I would do anything different uh, 
maybe take back some things that I've said in a joking matter that hurt some people's feelings. Uh, I don't think I, it's, it's anything I'll do different. I would, I would go back to, tomorrow if they let me. The only thing I don't like about being retired is being retired. I'd rather be a firefighter. Uh, and I will say, I think I did a few good things for the firefighters. Uh, when we first come home, you had sheets that was rented that come from the hospital. And that was in that big game bedroom at Central Station. I think we had 22 people mm -hmm. up there, some good, good number. And they was washed. You got new sheets once a week. But that's after three people slept on that sheets all week. They didn't, uh, you didn't have individual sheets. You, you had the rental towels, and we'd get some of the sheets come in from some of the hospitals, and they wouldn't be the cleanest. They had little stains on them. And uh, finally, I opened a fitness center, and I started a... Uh, matter of fact, I had a guy work for me. It would eat pizza underneath the counter. Uh, I think his name was Chief Cockman. <laughs> Anyway, make a long story short. Uh, got a little sidetracked there. <laughs> but I, I would uh, buy my own towels and I had a good place by. So I got the price and the price of sheets. And I took it to uh, Chief Spears, who graciously looked at it and said, You're right, we can save a lot of money. And I think they ended up saving several hundred dollars per year per station to buy our own sheets and get them out. And that was when I was at station 10. So we originally started two towels for each guy and you take care of washing them. You know, they finally put washers and dryers in the station in the sheets. So we had to write everybody's name on two towels, uh, which was, I didn't realize how much the fire department had grown. So we got tired of writing names. And we throw them up on top of the truck and go and deliver them to each station. When I come on the fire department, there was 125 firefighters and secretaries. And I think now there's over 600. There was nine fire stations. Now I think there's 26 fire stations. So we've grown quite a bit. Some of my proudest moments would be, uh, gosh, I don't know how many, <laughs> uh, besides my kids being born, would be the last day uh, when I got the, when they named the Fitness Award after me. What was the name of the award? It was Cliff Hoakley Fitness Award, and, which was uh, an honor. Now, the last station I was at, we were family, especially B-Shift, the shift I was on, and we still get together. Still is. What station? That was Station 5, uh, Rescue 5, Ladder 5, and Engine 5. Uh, the only other place that compared with that was uh, when I was at Station 11, the old Station 11, which was named the uh, Animal House, which is a whole story in itself. Uh, they built a new station uh, across the street, and that's the puppy mill. Uh, <laughs> but that Family still, yes, we got. I was over to one of them's wife that had a house the other night that got killed. My main goal as far was to make my family proud. Uh, there again, if anybody says they're not scared, the 23rd Psalm. Uh, he loved the department. Excuse me? He loved the department. Okay. Whatever J.E. McCarter said. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, I hope the fire department remembers me as trying to do some good. Uh, if not, Mr. Walker, Sean Kennedy, Kenny uh, Robinson and, and many, many others have done so much for the fitness in the fire department. 
to enable these firemen to work longer, live longer, uh, and we was able to get a gym or a fitness room in each station. We was able to uh, get a gym for police fire. We was able to get a, a gym for the fire and public works. And we was even able to get a gym for the sanitation workers. Uh, so hopefully that will be what I'm remembered for. Uh, uh, just like Jesse Walker. Uh, He's the same way. I remember an old fireman, uh, it wasn't old then, uh, uh, Faust, Steve Faust. Uh, he, would, he was a Green Beret, and he would run to Station 7 in the mornings, which he lived seven miles away. And I'd hear him going around and around the station, running, it cooled off on the outside station. Then look out back and he had a chin-up bar and he'd be doing chin-ups. And I said, and I always thought, I said, when I grew up, I want to be like him. And we finally got for a bunch of us would meet at Station 7, which was at Gatewood and Wendover, and run to Station 10, which was at uh, Gate City Boulevard in Merritt. Uh, and, and it wouldn't be just one. We'd have seven, eight, nine, ten. And then we used to go out to High Cone Road at the uh, food line there, and I'd jog from there to the training center, and then from the training center to the park to the station on the weekends. That was 14 miles. Uh, but the only reason I liked working out, because anybody that works out, if they tell you it's fun, they tell them it was to lengthen my career. And to stay here with Donna and all my kids. We, and you, I went through training with Cliff Oakley, and he was the best in training. And I always wanted to be a good firefighter as Cliff Oakley. And I never could, but I always wanted to be. You were what I call a firefighter's firefighter and somebody that I highly respected and loved, and I mean that. Well, I appreciate that. And it was, you know, I never worried about putting the fire out. My, my goal was to get my guys back to the station safely. After a major wreck that I was in, the most afraid I was was on the way to the call. <laughs> And, but as long as no one got hurt, the fire was going to stop eventually, whether it be on Elm Street or Green Street. It's going to, it's going to stop. They actually call me Captain. <laughs> I guess from being around the station so much, most of my grandkids call me Captain. Really? Yes. Wow. Uh, there are a few of them. A few of them, two, three of them call me Paul Fall, but most of them call me Captain. I got ten, so. <laughs> That's a, a lot. Uh, I hope you remember me of caring about people. Uh, I, I, I lose my temper when I see somebody abusing somebody else. And it don't necessarily mean physically I'm talking about talking down to them. Uh, and that being is because I've made that mistake. And it's been too late to go back and apologize. I've made that mistake to other firefighters. And paramedics, they, uh, probably, they would probably never forgive me because I grabbed a few that were doing things I didn't think was correct uh, to let them know that we was in charge until we got the victim out. So, it may hit the cutting room floor, but that's all right. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, I got city. Uh, it was one of the other things. I got city employee of the year. Okay. Which was really good because I got a check for $500. <laughs> it was the last one they get. Well, what year was that? Uh, I don't know. I have to look at this. That's fine. <laughs>
You got City of Boy. Uh, 2003, I think. Okay. We hope you enjoyed watching these documentaries. It was our goal to share and preserve the memories of our retired Greensboro firefighters. It is our desire that these documentaries will inspire future generations to continue the brotherhood, sisterhood, and camaraderie while always striving for excellence in their careers. While fire apparatus, equipment, and technology have improved, several things will always remain the same. The courage and bravery it takes to mitigate natural and man-made disasters will always be a part of the job. Although our retirees are no longer a physical part of the GFD world, a giant piece of each retiree's memories have been shared with you today. These memories will be in their hearts and minds forever. A special thank you goes out to Captain Harold Haney for his many long hours of recording and editing. Thank you, Harold. A job well done. Mm -hmm.